Welcome back to Asia Talk. Again, we're talking with Sarah Cook about Gao Zhishen and his book, A China More Just. Now, Sarah, we were talking about Gao uh, winning cases kind of being recognized by the ministry, but you mentioned at the beginning that he's now missing. How did he go from winning this acclaim to being persecuted himself? Well, a big part of it was that as Gao started taking on more and more cases, people were writing to him um, from all across China, and he started taking on more so-called sensitive cases. Uh, especially, he started beginning to help people who were victims of religious persecution, pastors, house Christians, and people who practice Falun Gong, um, which is like a, a mind-body meditation practice that's been banned in China since 1999. And he tells a story about he came across this man named Huang Wei, who had been sentenced to a labor camp for three years because he practiced Falun Gong. He was like, he'd walk, he was deliver, dropping his kid off at nursery school or something like that, and the police just picked him up and sentenced him to three years in prison. Well, early on in the persecution, one of the first things the government did was they said lawyers were not allowed to defend Falun Gong practitioners. But somehow this guy managed to get his Gao Zhisheng to know about his story. And so Gao goes to Shijiazhuang or whatever city that the, the practitioner was in, visits him in the labor camp and tries to take his case to court for judicial review, which is what you would do here if somebody, or in any other democracy or any country with a decent legal system, you would go and you would ask the judge to reconsider the mm -hmm. fact that somebody was arbitrarily detained. Because um, he was sentenced to labor camp without any trial, no ju judge, nothing. Well, the judge looks at the piece of paper and says, don't you know we don't take Falun Gong cases? And Gao goes to like three different courtrooms in one day, and all the judges will, will not take the case. So what he then does is he writes an open letter to the National People's Congress um, detailing this, this whole situation with this case, because like I can't work through the legal system anymore. What am I going to do? Uh, and that's really the, fir the first time he's starting to take on these, these cases of Falun Gong. And so it's really the Falun Gong cases that brings him to this more public, uh, public, uh, open letter that you mentioned. And, yeah. Well, I think what you saw early on is like with the, the the medical malpractice case and some of the other cases he took, he he couldn't make progress on behalf of his client by going through the legal system. But then you have this incredible taboo. I mean, Falun Gong is one of the big, biggest taboos in Chinese society right now, um, with the legal system, with practitioners being completely. Um, sidetracked out of the legal system and so he had no choice but to take some other route and so what he then he does he starts doing his own investigations and he's done this with other groups too he's done this with house Christians he's done this especially in Xinjiang but with Falun Gong what he did is he did this investigation in northeastern China which has some of the most severe cases of torture um, of Falun Gong adherents and he wrote an open letter in October 2005 to the, the president of China Hu Jintao and the premier Wen Jiabao uh, detailing a lot of this and basically calling for an end to the persecution of Falun Gong. And it was basically about a week after that, within days of writing that letter, that the police start putting him and his family into 24 hour surveillance. There are plainclothes police and officers following his 13 year old daughter to school. He can't leave his home. That's really when he starts his journal um, that's in the book about talking about how they're following them and, and, and all of that. Um, a few weeks later, they took away his license to practice law. And for me, after reading this book and seeing what he had to go through to get that, you really see the impact of the fact that now they're saying, Gao Zhishang, you can't practice law anymore. So it's quite clear that even though he had been representing repressed groups before, it was Falun Gong that really was the touchstone that caused uh, him and his family to be scrutinized, persecuted, followed. I, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it all kind of happens at the same time. And so at the same time as he's taking Falun Gong cases, he's defending other... Um, starts defending other human rights activists, starts um, defending Christians and stuff like that. But certainly it was the, the public um, statements about Falun Gong that was something that hadn't happened in China before. You didn't really have that going on. And, and it was something that the Chinese Communist Party is very, very afraid of. So nobody had spoken out against, uh, for Falun Gong? There had been small cases, and you had other cases of maybe lawyers taking, the, taking him, but nobody of prominence like him, nobody who was a, you know, a nationally known lawyer um, writing an open letter to the president and saying, look, you have to stop this right now. And what do you think was it that prompted him to, uh, to take that step? Was it the severity of the cases? What happened? Um, I'll, maybe I'll read part of the letters and then, and then that will help people understand. I think for him it was he was aware of the persecution before. He didn't understand the extent of the brutality 
And I think he was also, and he talks about that, he was also very moved by the peaceful resistance adherence and the fact that put up against the persecution to resist it. Um, so maybe I'll just read a bit, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, because what Gal said. Yeah. This is also t to kind of keep in mind that this letter that he's writing is about this oppressed religious minority that nobody's really said a fair word about. So understand the, the difficulty in writing something like this. With a trembling heart and a trembling pen, I record the tragic experiences of those who have been persecuted in the last six years. Of all the true accounts of incredible violence that I have heard, of all the records of the government's inhuman torture of its own people, what has shaken me most is the routine practice on the part of the 610 office and the police of assaulting women's genitals. Who that can rightly be called a human being could possibly stay silent in the face of these facts? It is time for the government to fess up. I would like to stress that if this evil crime does not stop, then the day when Chinese society is stable and harmonious will never come. Meanwhile, in communicating with people of such conviction, I saw them demonstrate qualities invaluable to our nation. The fact that they were able to describe their horrible experiences with a pleasant countenance and a calm tone of voice left a deep impression. I found myself moved to tears. I am finally seeing people in this country with an unyielding spirit and a resolve to protect something dear to their souls. These six years of persecution have fashioned a group of people unparalleled in character. The realm of mind they demonstrate through the solidity of their faith, their contempt for the atrocities they endure, and their optimism about our nation's future has earned my deepest respect. I think you really see from his own words what it was about this that, that inspired him to take the risks that he's taken in trying to defend these people. So it's really the courage of the Falun Gong adherents themselves that inspired him to take their cases. I think he just really saw the, 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 the magnitude of so many millions of innocent and normal, ordinary people mm -hmm. like this guy Huang Wei, who was trying to, he had already been sentenced to a labor camp before and he was trying to reconstitute his life and he goes and drops his kid off in kindergarten and gets abducted. Mm -hmm. That that just really touched Gao Zhishong's heart.